Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is September 30, 1977, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 26. Last month, after a silence of three months, I once again began recording the AUDIO LETTER, and I told you that we are now entering a new phase, namely the fulfillment of the plans for economic collapse dictatorship and war about which I have been trying to warn you. I had hoped and prayed that this phase would never happen, that people would listen, would grasp the truth, and would do their duty under our representative form of government to stop our slide into catastrophe. But my friends, it was not to be. Many millions of Americans are now familiar with many of the warnings I have relayed to you from my own intelligence sources, yet all but a few are blind to the reality of the danger. Their attitude is just to wait and see, not realizing that when they do see all these things it will be too late to do anything. The entire United States Congress, too, is well aware of all my charges. But as usual, they merely pass the buck, telling their worried constituents not to worry, that the Carter Administration says there's nothing to it, and of course they wouldn't lie. Meanwhile the only real response that the government is now making to my charges is to try to silence the AUDIO LETTER. At stake is not only the survival of the AUDIO LETTER, but also the United States. I receive many letters these days from listeners who are concerned about bitter criticism leveled at me by various organizations and commentators. Invariably my detractors proclaim themselves to be reliable, honest, and a source you can trust. Then they proceed to distort what they tell their readers ridiculing my warnings and urging their readers to ignore me. One of the favorite tricks in this campaign against me is to refer to that old standby, that famous letter to me from General George S. Brown, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, dated September 1, 1976. In this letter General Brown stated in the present tense that he could find no evidence of the Soviet underwater missiles along our shores whose locations I had given in AUDIO LETTERS No. 14 and 15. And this statement was technically correct, my friends, since the United States Navy had just completed the process of removing all the Soviet missiles from our coastal waters the day before. Then the letter went on to open the door for direct contact between General Brown and myself. And as a result, on September 16, 1976, just over two weeks after the letter of September 1st, I met with General Brown in his Pentagon office for over an hour without interruptions and without any time limitation. The purpose of that meeting was specifically to enable me to personally give General Brown 48 new locations of Soviet missiles in our waters so that General Brown could order them removed. Thus General Brown wrote to me on September 1, 1976, and we met in his office over two weeks later on September 16, 1976. But those who seek to mislead and betray their readers usually refer only to the letter. My meeting with General Brown usually is not mentioned, even though the fact we met is a matter of public record. Those who do acknowledge that there was a meeting neglect to mention when it took place, and thereby leave the reader with the false impression that the letter of September 1st ended the matter. This is only one example of the techniques that are being used to fool and confuse the unwary. I mention it only to alert you not to just swallow what you are told, but examine it with care. My friends, I cannot and I will not be distracted from the real battle by all of these falsehoods. Simply put, there are some who would have more faith in the Soviet Union than in what I am telling you. 
Only a miracle can save us now, my friends, and we as a nation do not deserve such a miracle. Nearly a year and a half ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 11 for April 1976, I revealed the growing fears of the trustees of the major Rockefeller-controlled foundations that the program for world domination had jumped the tracks, and my friends, they could not have been more right. This month, September 1977, has witnessed the beginning of the end for the Rockefellers and also for America as we know it. On the night of the Harvest Moon, September 27, 1977, the most decisive battle of the 20th century ended in a stunning upset. This battle, known only to a handful of individuals in the world, was the culmination of the great secret race in superweapons which I reveal to you in AUDIO LETTER No. 20 for January 1977. And, my friends, the Soviet Union won. Now the Soviet Union is mobilizing for war. Confident at last, the Rockefeller cartel can no longer stand in their way as they conquer the entire world. The four Rockefeller brothers, having set the world on its present disastrous course, can no longer do anything about what is about to happen. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, War in Space, the Battle of the Harvest Moon, September 27, 1977. Topic No. 2, The Last Days of the Rockefeller Empire. And Topic No. 3, The American Dream in memoriam. Topic No. 1. Twenty years ago, on October 4, 1957, the Space Age began with the launching of Sputnik 1 by the Soviet Union. Barely three and one-half years later, on May 25, 1961, President John F. Kennedy made the thrilling announcement that the United States was launching a program to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth before the end of the decade. Many Americans could hardly believe their ears. The Sputnik shock still had not worn off, and the Soviet space program was far ahead of our own. And for several years after the Kennedy announcement, the idea that we would beat the Russians to the moon looked more and more ridiculous. Americans ground their teeth in frustration as we watched the Soviet Union pile up one record after another in space. The first man in space, the first woman in space, the first spacewalk, records for time in orbit, and so on and on. But the Kennedy announcement in 1961 had signaled much more than a mere race with the Russians. It was a crash program ten times bigger than the Manhattan Project to develop the atom bomb in World War II, and gradually it began to pay off. The one-man space shots of Project Mercury gave way to the two-man missions of Project Gemini, and then at last Project Apollo with its three-man crews was underway. Finally it was the Americans who were setting records in space, while the Russians seemingly began to lose heart. They busied themselves with orbital missions, but it became increasingly apparent that they would not soon put a man on the moon after all. On July 20, 1969, the impossible dream came true. After eight years and $24 billion, the Apollo 11 landing craft made a perfect landing on the moon in the Sea of Tranquility. Neil Armstrong, as he placed man's first footprint on the moon, said those famous words, That's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. The Soviet Union sulked at being beaten. Red China called the whole thing a hoax, but the rest of the world cheered. It was a great moment to be an American. For three years America and the world watched as the exploits of the Apollo teams on the moon expanded at an astonishing pace. But then, strangely, 
the Apollo program was cut short to save money, we were told. After six successful moon landings, the last three, potentially the most productive and spectacular of all, were unceremoniously lopped off, supposedly to save about 1% of the amount it had cost to reach the moon in the first place. After all, everyone knew we had gone to the moon merely as an exhilarating adventure and to pick up a few moon rocks for scientists to tinker around with. So having done that, we were told that it would be better to save those last few space dollars and put them into welfare checks or bullets for Vietnam. And so on December 19, 1972, the Apollo 17 crew lifted off from the Sea of Serenity, and America said farewell to the moon. That is what we were told, my friends, but that is not what happened. In AUDIO LETTER No. 19 for December 1976, I told you why America was not the first nation to orbit a space satellite, and now I can reveal the sequel, the true purpose and outcome of the race to the moon. America's space program has always been portrayed as a purely peaceful scientific adventure without any ulterior motives. But my friends, the Rockefellers never spend $24 billion even if it's our own money, on anything that does not promise to reward them very handsomely. And these rewards, in the case of the space program, extend far beyond the great profits reaped by their aerospace companies. It is, or was until three days ago, the very keystone of their secret military machine for the conquest of the world. From the beginning, America's race to put a man on the moon had a military objective. The impetus for this race lay in a seemingly unrelated development, the laser, which was invented in 1960. The laser was a predictable outgrowth of an earlier American invention called the Maser, invented in 1953, and therefore by the time the laser made its debut, it had been anticipated and military uses for it were under intensive study. The first hint of the things to come was a proposal by a laser scientist in 1961, the same year that President Kennedy launched the crash program to put a man on the moon. The scientists suggested that lasers which produced narrow, intense beams of light could be used for interplanetary communication by flashing coded signals back and forth. What the scientists did not mention was that the destructive effect of extremely powerful lasers could also be projected for tremendous distances through space for space warfare. Worse yet, theoretical studies had already revealed that an even more awesome energy beam weapon was possible. This advanced weapon on the horizon was the terrifying particle beam which was first brought to public attention early this year by General George Keegan, the freshly retired Chief of the United States Air Force Intelligence. In a particle beam weapon, huge quantities of atoms are torn to shreds and fired out of the barrel at the target in a continuous concentrated beam that travels at almost the speed of light. The process requires fantastic amounts of energy, and the effect on any target is also fantastic. The very atoms that make up the target are torn to pieces by the beam, and the target explodes. With lasers and the particle beams looming as potential new military weapons, the moon suddenly became an inviting military objective. The moon is a quarter million miles from Earth and it takes several days for a spaceship to travel that distance, but it only takes about one and a half seconds for radio signals or light to travel that far. Therefore a moon base equipped with high-power lasers or particle beam weapons would be able to strike any visible spot on Earth within two seconds of pulling the trigger, and during any period of just over 24 hours all or most of the populated areas of the Earth can be seen from the moon. The only exceptions are Arctic and Antarctic regions during parts of each month. 
and since a particle beam will bore right through clouds or storms to hit a target, a moon base will be an all-weather weapon. Finally, once it was in operation, this moon base will be virtually immune to attack by any less sophisticated weapon. For example, if a rocket were fired at the moon from Earth with a nuclear warhead to destroy the moon base, it would be useless. Long before it reached the moon, it could be destroyed by a blast of the particle beam. When the Rockefellers learned of the great potential of the moon for military purposes, the decision was made to launch a crash program to seize the moon for this purpose. The Soviet space program had been given a head start over that of America by means of Sputnik 1 disgrace, and under the hard driving direction of an engineer named Leonid Brezhnev, the Soviet lead in space was widening every day. But the Russian approach to exploiting space for military purposes was heavily oriented toward Earth orbital applications. Space stations would come first. After that, moon missions could be launched sometime in the future. For all the propaganda we heard about it at the time, a manned mission to the moon was not a top Soviet priority in 1961. But the Sputnik shock still had not worn off, and the Soviet space program was undeniably ahead of our own in 1961. So it was not very hard for the Rockefellers to convince America through their controlled major media that Russia was on its way to the moon and would beat us there if we did not do something. Having built up this public concern, the Rockefeller Public Relations machine then provided us with the solution to our worries. The space frontier was sold to us as exemplifying the bold spirit of President John F. Kennedy's so-called new frontier. The dormant and suppressed American spirit of free adventure was tapped and channeled into enthusiastic, unquestioning support for the space program, even though we were never given anything more than the vaguest justifications for it. Thus a military project dwarfing the Manhattan Project was set in motion in full public view and drawing upon the very best talent and facilities that money could buy. Only the purpose of the Moon Project was kept a secret, and that secret was made secure by bathing the whole space program in the glare of continuous publicity. It was a clever plan, and it worked. By the time of the Apollo 17 mission in December 1972, the space program had become routine to many Americans, and they were looking around for other circuses to amuse themselves and plenty of these were provided, including especially the budding Watergate scandal. Now space travel could safely be removed from public view and carried on secretly with far less danger of attracting attention than a decade before. Meanwhile, the Rockefellers, by way of their controlled CIA, had been working feverishly in total secrecy on beam weapons at locations outside the United States such as a CIA-supported laser experiment installation in Spain. By 1972 these experiments still were a long way from a suitable weapon for deployment on the moon, but ominous developments in the Soviet Union led to the decision to cut off the Apollo program prematurely so that the construction of the secret moon base could be rushed ahead. Starting in 1967, the Soviet Union launched a massive program of its own to develop a particle beam weapon. This is what the Russians had started concentrating on instead of an immediate moon flight in the late 60s. Then in 1971 the Soviet Civil Defense Program was stepped up, and on October 4, 1972, Soviet Civil Defense was elevated to a status equal to the Armed Services. Less than three months later, in December, Apollo 17 became the last American moon flight to be acknowledged publicly. The October 4, 1972 upgrading of Soviet civil defense initiated a high-priority five-year plan which ends four days from now, 
the day after the expiration of the SALT I Accord. Under this plan, much of the Soviet Union has literally gone underground, complete with underground silos filled with American grain, and thousands of underground shelters able to withstand near misses of ICBMs. Strategic command centers and communications networks are underground now in the Soviet Union, and this was done not only to render any missile attack survivable, but also to provide some protection against any possible particle beam attack from the moon. Early in 1973, soon after the supposed end of the American Moon Program, we began hearing about a place called Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. Supposedly we were merely building a communications installation there, yet the drastic step was taken of relocating all the 20,000 or so natives of this little island to other areas. More recently we have heard about Diego Garcia as the site of a new American naval base, but my friends, you still haven't been told the whole story. Diego Garcia, my friends, is the new spaceport from which secret missions to the moon have been launched during the building of the moon base. Unlike Cape Canaveral, where Saturn rocket launches are impossible to hide, Diego Garcia is remote and isolated, and even the natives are no longer there to watch what goes on. What's more, Diego Garcia is practically the perfect moon port located as it is almost on the Earth's equator, and a space vehicle launched eastward into orbit from Diego Garcia passes over a nearly unbroken expanse of water for more than half the circumference of the Earth. The only means of monitoring the early flight of a spacecraft launched from Diego Garcia, therefore, is from ships. If you have been unclear as to why Jimmy Carter has been talking so much about demilitarizing the Indian Ocean, which means Russia stay out, now you know. I was first alerted to the existence of a secret base on the moon last November 1976, but it has been one of the best kept of all Rockefeller secrets, and it was only a few weeks ago that I was able to confirm its existence and learn the complete story. And since that time, events have moved with lightning speed. Throughout this year an unseen but deadly race has been underway to see who would get an operational particle beam first, the Rockefellers at their secret moon base or the Soviet Union in Earth orbit. By late spring a Salyut manned spacecraft was launched that carried out preliminary tests of beam weapon techniques using lasers in order to simulate the particle beam. Then on July 17, 1977, a large Soviet satellite called Cosmos 929 was launched. It has mystified satellite watchers because of its strange behavior in radio signals. Most observers have concluded that it is unmanned, having detected no verbal communications but it is manned. It is a twin satellite consisting of a command module and a separate particle beam weapon module. All communications between the crew of Cosmos 929 and the Soviet tracking network are carried on by modulated laser beams, which cannot be detected at all by anyone who is not directly in the beam path. A particle beam is a fearsome weapon. And nearly two months of painstaking preparation and check-out of all systems preceded the first test. Meanwhile, American astronauts on the moon worked at frenzied pace to try to bring their particle beam installation to operational status. By early September this month, the first particle beam unit on the moon was being assembled. A few days later the crew of Cosmos 929 tested their Particle Beam Unit by firing it into open space to verify that it would function properly. It did. The next step was to test the beam against the target. The target chosen was an American spy satellite 
As it passed over the Petrozavodsk Observatory, which lies east of southern Finland, Cosmos 929 was nearly 1,000 miles to the south near the Black Sea. The local time was roughly 4 a.m. Tuesday, September 20, 1977, and the Moon was on the other side of the Earth. The crew of the Moon Base were therefore unable to observe the test. Aided by computers, Cosmos 929 aimed and fired. The American satellite erupted into an immense fireball of light, which the Soviet News Agency task described as a huge star which flashed out of a dark sky, sending shafts of light impulses to Earth. It took several minutes to dwindle to a red glow and burn out as it drifted eastward, and it was witnessed as far away as Helsinki, Finland, over 300 miles to the west. News reports that day in this country dismissed it all as a curious jellyfish-like UFO. Four days later, September 24, the Soviet Navy, without explanation, expelled all British and French fishing trawlers, among others from the Barents Sea. At the same time, Soviet trawlers in European community waters were called home. By the 26th of September, American personnel at the secret Rockefeller Moon Base nestled in Copernicus Crater were almost ready. Their particle beam was almost operational, but they were too late. By late that day, the Soviet Union began bombarding the Moon Base with a neutron particle beam. Through the night and all day on September 27, the Moon Base was bombarded without mercy with neutron radiation just like that produced by a neutron bomb. And by that evening, as Americans looked up at the peaceful full moon overhead known as the Harvest Moon, the last few Americans on the moon were dying of neutron radiation. America had lost the battle of the Harvest Moon. My friends, in 1945 America became the first nation on Earth to possess an awesome new superweapon, the atomic bomb, but now it is the Soviet Union that has won the race for a new superweapon, the particle beam, that could be as decisive today as the atomic bomb was in 1945. The Rockefellers have disarmed America while betting everything on the moon base, thinking they would win the race, but they made a terrible miscalculation, and now we will all suffer the consequences. Topic No. 2 The Rockefeller Soviet Alliance, which has just come apart, was indispensable to the Rockefeller plot to control the world. This was the master stroke that enabled the Rockefellers to follow up their destruction of the British Empire with an active menace that would prevent a revival of Britain and Europe as powerful independent rivals. The final phase of all this was to be Nuclear War I, primarily on American soil. It was to kill tens of millions of Americans, yet it was to be a programmed, limited nuclear war with the outcome decided ahead of time. In the aftermath, the Rockefellers were to have been enthroned as America's absolute dictators. Europe and Britain were to be absorbed into the Soviet orbit of control, exhausted from energy and other shortages, but virtually unscathed by war itself. That was the deal between the Rockefeller brothers and the Kremlin partners, but true to their tradition, the Rockefellers had a double cross up their sleeve as the culmination of Nuclear War I. To prepare for the war, their plan was to denude America of most of its military power while building up an awesome military machine in the Soviet Union. When the programmed war came, it would be so destructive and America's plight so helpless that despair would seize us all. But then, in our darkest hour, with half of America's population gone, the secret moon base 
bristling with particle beam weapons would come to the rescue. In the space of at most a few days Soviet military forces worldwide were to be destroyed and vast numbers of Russians were to die in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was not supposed to know about this final act. Instead, they were to be caught by surprise and utterly destroyed, and after the fact the plan was not to tell the world about the moon base. Instead, the Rockefellers would emerge as the only organized power on Earth, and they would attribute it all to, quote, divine intervention, unquote. By this stratagem they expected to deceive the world, or most of us, to accept their rule as divinely ordained. In this way they were to become the final heirs of the secret commitment for a one-world government that was set in motion so long ago. In 1924 John D. Rockefeller, Jr., the father of the four Rockefeller brothers, talked of his dream of the day when, quote, no one will speak of my country but we will speak of our world." Unquote. And on January 31, 1945, before the Protestant Council of New York City, he delivered an address entitled, The Christian Church, What of Its Future? In this speech he expounded one of his favorite topics, the need as he saw it for the Christian Church as we know it to be replaced with something more suitable as the direct outcome of the very conflicts which the Rockefeller Empire itself had secretly spawned. Praising the self-sacrifice and loyalty of millions whose lives were being ruined and snuffed out, Rockefeller painted it all as a wonderful crusade. With growing enthusiasm he said, What an opportunity! What a privilege! What a duty! The nightmare of World War, in other words, was merely a necessary prelude to the future status he envisioned for the Christian Church. Quote, it would be the Church of the Living God. Unquote. It would be devoid of all quote, ordinance, ritual, creed, all non-essential, stripped of its camouflage. John D. Rockefeller, Jr. was reviving the ancient concept of the God King, the ruler who is to be worshipped and who can do no wrong. But unknown to the Rockefellers until very recently, the Soviet Union found out years ago about the final Rockefeller plan to destroy them in a double cross by means of the moon base. That is why the Soviet Union initiated a crash program to develop a particle beam of their own ten years ago, and this is why they launched such massive efforts in civil defense five years ago. This is why the Soviet Union tried to surprise the Rockefellers over a year ago with their own double cross during the summer of 1976, beginning with the underwater nuclear missile crises. As of a year ago, the Particle Beam Weapons Race was very close, but it appeared that the Rockefeller Moon Base would win. As an interim black mail system, the Rockefellers had arranged for the CIA super missiles to be planted in the oceans by the Glomar Explorer and other means, as I first revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 20 for January 1977. But as of now, only two of these CIA super missiles Atlantic Missiles No. 1 and 2 are still operational, all the rest having been ruined by gradual corrosion and leakage. By now the Rockefellers expected to have their secret moon base operational, rendering the CIA blackmail missiles obsolete. The Kremlin was afraid that the Rockefellers were going to succeed, dooming the Soviet Union to certain disaster at the hands of the moon base. So they decided to strike first in a surprise attack. The result was the Soviet Underwater Missile Crisis of 1976 described in AUDIO LETTERS 14 through 16, July through September 1976.
As I described in AUDIO LETTER No. 16, a Soviet missile laying mini-sub became trapped in Chesapeake Bay in late September 1976. It was our perfect opportunity to blow the whistle and stop the entire Soviet program of preparation for surprise attack by making it public, but as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 17 for October 1976, this chance was thrown away by President Gerald Ford and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger in their Red Friday Agreement arranged at the White House with Andre Gromyko one year ago tomorrow. At the time such an abject capitulation seemed as incomprehensible as it was treasonous. Later I learned of the CIA super-missiles which the Rockefellers continued to hold as a club over the head of the Kremlin, and it made more sense. But only now, in the light of the Moon Base and the Rockefeller plan for a final double-cross, does it all make sense. The Rockefeller brothers thought that they could assure themselves of surviving the war, and expected to have the Moon Base ready to destroy the Soviet Union at will. Under these conditions, the more horrendous the warfare up to the point of their falsified divine intervention, the better from their point of view. Their objective was total control, including the spiritual deception of millions. The Soviets, meanwhile, were preparing for a doomsday approach, that is, to be in a position to threaten such total destruction worldwide with all their underwater nuclear weapons that the Rockefellers would be afraid to trigger all-out war by using the Moon Base. But three days ago, on the night of the Harvest Moon, September 27, 1977, it all unraveled. America lost the Battle of the Harvest Moon. That same day, Tuesday, September 27, 1977, Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko delivered an ultimatum to the United States in a speech at the United Nations. A few days earlier the Soviet Navy had expelled all British and French fishing trawlers from the Barents Sea, and as Gromyko spoke the Barents Sea was filling up with scores of Soviet submarines, massing in preparation for deployment into the North Atlantic. And at the same time the huge Pacific Soviet submarine fleet was massing in the Sea of Okhotsk off the southwest tip of the Kamchatka Peninsula for deployment into the North Pacific. And on top of that, six more Particle Beam satellites were being readied for launch from four Soviet Cosmodromes, one each at Baikonur and Tyuratam, and two each at Kapustin Yar and Plasetsk, two Particle Beam satellites, Cosmos 929 and another, were already in orbit by that time. At the United Nations, Gromyko denounced the fact that relations between the United States and the Soviet Union have entered a period of, quote, stagnation if not a downright slump, unquote. Then he demanded that a new agreement limiting nuclear arms be arrived at, quote, without any delay." Unquote. Most people did not recognize this as a veiled ultimatum, but the Rockefellers did. Gromyko added that the Soviet Union is now ready to halt underground nuclear tests for a while, even if others do not. The reason for this statement, which surprised everyone, is that the Particle Beam has now superseded all nuclear weapons as a front line of Soviet armaments. That evening an unusual nighttime meeting with Jimmy Carter was hastily arranged at the White House at Gromyko's demand. The Rockefeller major media went out of their way to portray this unexpected meeting as a good thing, despite Gromyko's very harsh words at the United Nations with breathless assurance that a breakthrough had apparently been achieved toward a new SALT Accord. But that, my friends, was not Gromyko's message at all. Boiled down to his essentials, here's what Gromyko told Carter in Vance on the night of the Harvest Moon, September 27, 1977. 
we, the Soviet Union, have today destroyed the American moon base, which your sponsors had planned to use against us in the coming war. Now it is we who are in command, and now we will oblige you with the war you have been working so hard to bring about. The war will now be fought on our terms, not yours, but you are to give no hint publicly about any of this. If you do, I am instructed to inform you that you and your sponsors will forfeit your status in America as well as your lives. The following day the massed Soviet submarine fleets began moving out of the Barents Sea and the Sea of Okhotsk, bound respectively for the east and west coasts of the United States. Other Soviet submarines were also ordered to converge on our country from positions worldwide. Yesterday Jimmy Carter held a news conference in which he did his best to obey Gromyko's instructions. His eyes puffy from sedation and lack of sleep, he talked about anything and everything, but he exposed the glowing CBS and other reports of two days earlier about an alleged salt breakthrough for what they were with the words, quote, an immediate agreement is not in prospect, unquote. And in his opening remarks, inserted in the context of energy matters, he blurted out, quote, the reason that we have to act is not because we have crises or emergencies at this present time, but because they are imminent." Unquote. And today, after a hurried meeting with Secretary of State Vance in New York, Gromyko left for Moscow. Meanwhile our space program has suddenly fallen on hard times. Yesterday for the second time in two weeks after many years of faultless launchings, an American rocket abruptly exploded during launch. This one, an Atlas Centaur, happened to be carrying an important communication satellite to be stationed over the Indian Ocean. Meanwhile the Soviet Union launched Soyuz 6, and there are signs that now at long last the Soviet Union will decide to go to the moon. After all, there is no longer anyone there to stop them, and the possibility exists that very soon there will once again be a Particle Beam Weapons Base on the Moon to menace the Earth, this time controlled by the Soviet Union. And just today the Houston NASA Space Center activities having to do with the American Moon Base were shut down. Meanwhile the Soviet Union has planted a total of at least 60 cobalt bombs in the sea worldwide for the generation of earthquakes by their cumulative effect. Several of these have been set off already, three near Indonesia, four in the Aleutian Trench, three in mid-Pacific west of California, and one in the Mediterranean some distance from Crete. Others are still planted along the Aleutians in east-west fracture zones in the Pacific and Atlantic in the Indian Ocean, including several west of Australia, around the Bismarck Archipelago northeast of Australia, near Panama, in the Mediterranean and the Caribbean, and in the Gulf of California. On Monday the SALT-1 agreement expires. The next day, October 4, is the 20th anniversary of Sputnik 1, and it also marks the completion of the five-year plan for civil defense in the Soviet Union. By October 7, if not before, the United States will be surrounded along our east, west, and Gulf coasts by almost the entire Soviet submarine fleet. As I say these words, 29 Soviet submarines have already arrived on location in the Gulf of Mexico. These like the Atlantic and Pacific fleets, which are converging on America in a pincer's movement, are armed with missiles carrying neutron warheads. There are well over 100 submarines in each of the two Soviet fleets that are heading here from Russia. This is by far the most massive and rapid deployment ever of the Soviet submarine fleet. As I mentioned last month, NATO considers the deployment to sea of the Soviet fleet 
as one of its most important signals that a conflict is about to begin. Therefore, my friends, I would not be doing my duty if I did not warn you that a national emergency, and possibly war itself, may be virtually upon us. Topic No. 3 181 years ago this month, on September 17, 1796, George Washington delivered his farewell address as the first President of the United States of America. Washington truly loved the infant nation he had led to freedom, and believed we would become at no distant period a great nation. As that great nation his dream was that we would give to mankind the magnanimous and too novel example of a people always guided by an exalted justice and benevolence. Washington left us with various warnings about pitfalls to be avoided, such as overgrown military establishments and foreign entanglements. But he went beyond that to urge upon us a positive pattern of behavior that would be unique in the world. Concerning foreign affairs, he said, Observe good faith and justice toward all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. Regarding the public trust of government officials, he said, I hold the maxim no less applicable to public than to private affairs that honesty is always the best policy. And as the bedrock of his other convictions, Washington stated firmly, Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, Religion and morality are indispensable supports. Washington's ideals to guide America were a revolutionary departure from Machiavelli's rules of power, which had been spelled out two centuries earlier. According to Machiavelli, the first rule of any ruler who wants to keep and increase his power must be to ignore all moral laws. False Promises continual deception and lies, betrayal of allies who have served their purpose, and regular deliberate wars are the keys to success, according to Machiavelli. For a century Washington's words generally prevailed over those of Machiavelli in America, and our nation grew and prospered as none before it. The main exception to this was the Civil War which was provoked partly by foreign intrigue into our affairs. And great European powers, primarily Britain and France, were preparing to intervene in our hour of strife and destroy our nation altogether. In this black hour President Abraham Lincoln turned to what was then the greatest Christian nation on earth, Russia. Tsar Alexander II greatly admired the United States and dreamed of transforming Russia's government into something similar in a step-by-step -step process. After receiving the sealed message from Lincoln, he said to the American envoy, quote, Before we open this paper or know its contents, we grant any request it may contain. On the day on which your President was inaugurated, we, Alexander II of Russia, signed the protocol which liberated 23 million serfs. Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, has freed 4 million slaves. Therefore, whatever he asks of Russia, Russia will grant, for Alexander II will not be a factor in the enslavement of any man." Unquote. In the autumn of 1863, at a critical tide in the war, the Russian Navy suddenly swarmed into the harbors of New York and San Francisco and anchored there. It was a dramatic, powerful signal to all other powers on earth to stay out of the Civil War, and stay out they did, with the result that despite our horrible self-inflicted wounds, the United States did survive as a free and independent nation. From that time onward, Russia was targeted for total destruction by the secret international powers who have been thwarted in their design to bring the United States under their control. They decided that Christian Russia must die to be taken over by a godless new governing system called Communism, 
established by the international financiers themselves. Meanwhile, financial allies were promoted within the United States also for conquest from within. Thus little-known ties began developing after the Civil War between the Rockefellers, the Morgans, and the Carnegies of America and the Rothschilds and other power brokers of Europe and the world. Shortly before the Spanish-American War, a quiet revolution took place in American foreign policy thanks to these secret international connections. Washington's dream for America was exchanged for the nightmare of Machiavellian politics. Soon the Spanish-American War was on, brought about by the deliberate sacrificing of American lives and the explosion of the battleship Maine. The fact that Spain had been genuinely trying to avoid a war made no difference. To the cries of, Remember the Maine, America went off to war. After the smoke cleared, it eventually came out that the war had been unnecessary, but the American people were puffed up with being suddenly a world power. The former Spanish possessions of Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines now lay in American hands. Most Americans were too pleased with America's new prestige to worry about the immorality of what we had done. And with that, 80 years ago the American people began to sell their soul. By 1904 there was a further shiver of things to come. As part of the secret agreements preventing America's new Pacific possessions from being disturbed by the Japanese, we sat by while Russia, the country that had saved the United States from extinction four decades earlier, suffered a Pearl Harbor type attack. The Russian fleet peacefully at anchor at Port Arthur, was attacked without warning by cracked Japanese warships and torn to shreds with heavy casualties. But the reaction among most Americans was not horror but a thrill at this great exploit. Thirty-seven years later a very similar attack on Pearl Harbor would be denounced by all Americans as a day of infamy, but in 1904 it was happening to someone else. So it was all right. Step by step for 80 years the American people have gradually blinded themselves to the truth by failing to cherish or look for it. And so we have been led to slaughter time and again, never learning from our experiences. In 1898 it was Remember the Maine. In 1917 it was Remember the Lusitania and the Sussex. In 1941 it was Remember Pearl Harbor. And now, in 1977, we are being set up for the cry of, Remember the Panama Canal. Only this time it will be different. In 1917 and afterward we repaid our brothers in Russia by sitting idly by as a Christian nation died. During our Civil War Russia had saved the United States from destruction by forbidding outside intervention, but in the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 it was outside intervention by American financiers that sealed Russia's fate. And we as a people sat idly by, acquiescing as the United States Government began propping up the satanic new government that caused the deaths of over 20 million Christians. Over a period of 60 years a Frankenstein monster has been built before our very eyes, the Soviet Union, and we as a people have done nothing whatsoever to stop it. Now the Soviet Frankenstein is turning on us, and we as a people are left without excuse for whatever may happen. Those who have refused to use their time and resources for the common good of our nation need not expect to use their money now to escape to some safe haven. There is none. Even Switzerland, with the best civil defense installations on earth outside the Soviet Union, has already been sabotaged by Soviet nuclear mines in Lakes Geneva, Zurich, Suk, Lucerne, Wallenstadt, Zarnen, Brents, Thun, Neuchâtel, Locarno, and Lugano. 
My friends, there will be salvation for some in this hour of trial, but it will be on an individual basis. Those who love the truth and who love our Lord Jesus the Christ and who have tried will not be deserted, but for those who do survive, I can only repeat what I said two and a half years ago in conclusion to my tape on the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. It is only those of us who have tried our best who will have peace in our hearts and answers for our enslaved children. Until next month, if God wills it, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God protect each and every one of you.